Hi all. This video is going to be the start of a series on the replication crisis in psychology. A while ago, we already did a video on this topic. That video focused on the thing that gave the replication crisis its name, namely the long list of psychological studies that have failed to replicate in the last 10 years or so. If you have not seen that video yet, we suggest that you do. Failed replications are an important topic, not least because they are the clearest indicator that there may be something seriously amiss in psychology. When researchers run a study again but do not get the same results as in the first study, then we need to be less confident that the results of the first study are true. And if enough studies in psychology do not replicate, then this calls the trustworthiness of psychology as a whole into doubt. The fact that a study didn't replicate does not tell us anything about why this study could not be replicated though. A study can fail to give the same results the second time around for many different reasons. Possible explanations include simple coincidence, errors that happened during data collection or statistical analysis, issues with the scientific publication system, or even outright fraud. So while a high rate of failed replication alerts us to the fact that something is likely going wrong, it does not tell us what it is exactly that is going wrong. We think that it is important to take a good look at what is going wrong. This is because we think that for all of us who want to better understand the human mind, how humans think, experience the world, interact, feel, behave and so on, there really isn't a better game in town than the scientific method. Done right, the science of psychology has the potential to be the source of fascinating insight and surprising discovery, but only if it's done right. This means that when we have good reason to think that a lot of the time psychology is not being done right, we should want to try and fix it. And to do that, a necessary first step is to figure out and discuss where and in what ways psychology right now falls short. In these videos, we are going to focus on psychology. In part, this is because that is what we know most about. But also, to their credit, psychologists have done more than researchers in most other fields to document and evaluate the shortcomings of their own discipline. This means that we just have a lot more data about the major causes of failed replications in psychology than in most other areas of science. This is not to say that psychology is the only area that has these issues. For example, there is evidence that studies in medicine and economics also replicated rates much lower than what we should be comfortable with. If you want to learn more about this topic, and in particular about how it affects not just psychology, but science more generally, we recommend you check out Stuart Ritchie's book, Science Fictions, Exposing Fraud, Bias, Negligence and Hype in Science. This series on the replication crisis is going to have three parts. The first part gives a brief sketch of how psychology is supposed to work. This is what we are going to do in this video today. Next, we will turn to a series of video on what we and many meta-scientists see as the main ways in which right now, the reality of psychology does not always live up to this ideal. Meta-scientists are people who study science using the methods of science itself. We will get to know a bunch of their work throughout this series. Finally, in the third and final part, we will look at ways in which we might fix or at least improve psychology. The ultimate goal of psychology, like that of any other science, is knowledge. Psychologists, in one way or another, want to better understand the world and the people in it. To achieve this goal, psychologists, again like other scientists, rely on a process that we and they call the scientific method. Science has been going on for a long time, and so of course, various people have had lots of different ideas about what precisely the scientific method is and how it is supposed to work. Nevertheless, we think that the broad outlines of this method, at least, in its current form, are not too difficult to explain. Most research projects start with reading the relevant scientific literature. In psychology, as in most other areas of science, the vast majority of research findings are reported in articles, often called papers, that are published in scientific journals. A journal is a bit like a newspaper for scientists. A place where researchers all over the world tell other researchers about their latest projects and what their results tell us about the world. There are many different psychology journals, some of which are very general. For example, Psychological Science and the Journal of Experimental Psychology General publish research from all areas of psychology. Other journals are quite niche. 
For example, the Journal of Mathematical Behavior focuses on publishing research that expands understanding of how people build, retain, communicate, apply and comprehend mathematical ideas. While for the longest time journals used to be printed and distributed on paper, today most of them are hosted online. Say that after studying various articles, you have come up with a research question that you find interesting and important. Perhaps there is an interesting theory that makes a prediction that you want to test. Or perhaps you have noticed a gap in our understanding of a psychological phenomenon and you want to plug it. You may even have come up with a novel idea yourself that you want to be the first to explore scientifically. Whichever the case may be, you will most likely need to run an experiment or a study of some sort. Psychological studies come in various different flavors, but they usually involve measuring the thoughts or the feelings or the behavior or whatever it is that you are interested in of people in some way, perhaps under specific conditions. Here is an example of a typical psychology study. Say you are interested in the role of disgust or moral judgment. Here's one way you might go about testing this idea. You recruit a group of people, your participants, and ask everyone to read a story about a character who does something morally dubious. Next, you ask your participants to tell you how wrong they think it is what the character in the story did, perhaps on a scale from 1 to 7. For one half of your participants, that's all you do. The other half, you induce to feel a bit disgusted while they're reading your story and answering your question. Perhaps you make these participants do the study next to a really smelly trash can. You then compare how wrong the participants in the two different groups found what the person in the story did. If the disgusted participants found what the person in the story did more wrong, then maybe disgust plays a role in moral judgement. In order to run your study, you will likely need money to pay for participants. Plus for things like study materials, lab space, if you are planning to run your study in person, or special equipment like an fMRI machine. There are different ways you can try to get your research funded. If you are already a researcher at a university or a company, then you may be able to convince the head of your lab or your boss to pay for your study. The other main way to get research funding is to apply for a grant, perhaps from your government, from an NGO, a trust fund or a charity. Most grants are very difficult to get though, so applying for one is often quite a long shot and also can take a lot of time. Once you have the money, you set up and run your study. This will typically leave you with a long spreadsheet containing many columns of data, which may look something like this. All of your participants' response will be in there. In addition, there will likely be other information like how long it took each participant to complete the study or the date when the study was run. In order to conclude anything from this data about the question you started with, for example, does disgust influence more judgment, this data will need to be analysed. This is where statistics comes in. We will talk a bit more about statistics in later videos. For now, let's just assume you have managed to analyse your data somehow, or you found a statistician to do this for you. All that's left for you to do now is to tell other psychologists in your field about your study and its results. We have already mentioned that the way this is done most of the time is to write up a paper about your research and to try to get it published in a scientific journal. While there is no one way of writing a psychology paper, most papers tend to follow the same rough outline. There will first be an introduction that explains how the research fits into the existing literature, then a section that explains how the researchers ran their study, so for example what materials they used, who participated in the study and so on followed by a section reporting how the researchers analysed their data and what the results of these analyses were, and finally a discussion of what the results mean, what open questions remain and what future research that addresses these open questions might look like. This leaves the question of how you get your paper published in a psychology journal. Proper scientific journals use a process called peer review, the idea of peer review is that before your paper can be added to the stores of psychological knowledge, it has to pass the rigorous examination of experts in the area of your research, your peers. This process is almost always anonymous, in the sense that you will usually not know who the experts are who are reviewing your paper, 
and the experts will usually not know that you are the author of the paper that they are reviewing. So how does this look in practice? When you send in your paper to a journal, it will first be looked at by an editor. This is usually a professor of psychology or some other researcher working full-time in a psychology department at a university. The editor looks at your paper and decides whether to reject it right then and there. When this happens, we call this a desk rejection. Having one of your papers desk rejected can really suck a lot. In this case, you can either try the next journal or shelve the paper and move on to other projects. If the editor does not reject your paper at this stage, she will send it out to one or more peer reviewers. These are experts in your area of research who will read your paper closely and write a detailed report on it. In their report, each reviewer will point out everything that they think is wrong with your paper, often including points that you will see as annoying nitpicks. The reviewers may also recommend to the editor whether your paper should be published in the journal as is, which almost never happens, should be sent back to you to revise in light of their criticisms, or should be rejected. In the second case, rinse and repeat this process until you either get rejected or it is deemed that you have revised your paper to a high enough quality for it to be published in the journal. Depending on which journals you try to submit to, how often you get rejected and how many rounds of revisions your paper goes through before eventually being accepted, it can take anywhere from a few months to several years to get a paper published. If you do end up getting published, hooray! Take the day off. Then it's time to start the whole process all over again for your next research project. Like we said earlier, the ultimate aim of the scientific method is knowledge. Psychology wants to find out true things about how people think, feel, interact with each other, experience the world, behave and so on. But, like we explain in our Psychology in Crisis video, there are serious reasons to think that psychology often falls far short of this aim. If many studies cannot be replicated, then there is reason to be a lot less confident that what these studies reported is true. After all, if it was true, then different researchers at different times should all be able to demonstrate this equally. But what is causing this? What is it that goes wrong? In the next videos, we will dive into some of the major factors that meta-scientists have argued are at play. Next time, we will start off with a factor that likely does not contribute an awful lot in the grand scheme of things. However, it makes up for its lack of relevance by being very entertaining. This is scientific fraud. The video will feature a story about a psychologist who, instead of going through the trouble of running actual studies, often just made up his research data from scratch. In one particular case, he did this while sitting at his kitchen table and eating most of the M&Ms that he had said he used in a study about the relationship between capitalism and consumption. Salacious stuff. Thank you for watching this video. We hope that we will see you around and stick around for more.